McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Well, hello, I'm Dennis McQuistion, and Jim and I have done so many programs on COVID-19 in the last year. But one of the questions in this particular program is, how have governments failed us or have they failed us in COVID-19? There's been a lot of conversation, partisan conversation mostly about the pros and cons, but we're gonna talk about it with a couple of guests. Take it away, Jim. And Dennis, thank you. We couldn't be with two better people to talk about this important topic. Uh, we are with uh, John Micklethwaite and Adrian Woolridge, the co-authors of The Wake Up Call, Why the Pandemic Has Exposed the Weakness of the West and How to Fix It. Formerly Editor-in-Chief of The Economist, John Micklethwaite has been since 2015 Editor-in-Chief of Bloomberg. Adrian Woolridge is the political editor of The Economist and was the former Washington Bureau Chief. John, Adrian, it's great to see both of you and thank you for being on the program. I think one of the things that I read about your, your new book is it came about very quickly. Uh, what, what motivated it? Was it the fact that we're in this pandemic or were you already uh, having this idea that was germinating for the last few years? Well, we've always been interested in the role of government in society. You know, to be very clear, we come from the kind of private sector, free market side of things. We're both at The Economist. But when we what looked at COVID, it became rapidly obvious two things. And actually, we would argue they're even more obvious now than they were then. The first is that government matters, good government matters. It's been the difference between living and dying. I just checked the numbers this morning. America is up around 1,300 deaths for every uh, million people. Britain, sadly, is 1,500. You go to Asia, though, and you find countries which have 40, 50 uh, deaths per million. And China claims the number of three. And that brings us to the second reason which we thought was interesting is that you look at the broad sweep of history. And since 1500, the West has been running everything. But since 1960, we would argue, um, Asia has got much better at government. And the same kind of numbers that you're seeing to do with COVID are exactly what's been happening with the schools, healthcare, all those sort of things. So this is coming from the point of view of two people who've always believed in the strength of the private sector, the strength of many things. But the bottom line in this case is if you have a lousy government, it doesn't help. And that is the challenge, we think, for Joe Biden and America for that much and other places. But we want the West to succeed. And that's the reason why we, we wrote this book, um, because we thought that there was a problem and we'd identified it. John, thank you for that. And Adrian, you and Jim Falk uh, did a very recent interview together for the World Affairs Council. And one of the things that I found fascinating was you differentiated between some of the Asian countries and their response and all that. Give us, give us just a sense of, a short sense of what those countries are and how they've done better than we have in the West. Yeah, I think basically the, 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 the East Asian countries have done significantly better than we had. Uh, China claims that its death rate is about three uh, people per million. And that's probably almost certainly, in fact, an exaggeration. We can't trust their figures fully. But even if it's off by a factor of, of, uh, of 10, even if it's 30 per million, that's an extraordinary uh, difference between the United States and its biggest geostrategic rival. Um, but it's, so China has, 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 has come out of this crisis, and it's obviously a crisis that began in China, um, really looking quite well. We say in the book that, it, that at first it looked as though this crisis was going to be uh, China's Chernobyl, and it turned out that it may have been the West's Waterloo. Um, we also say that um, many other countries in, in East Asia, such as Singapore, such as South Korea, such as Japan uh, and Taiwan, are also doing very, very significantly better than the United States or indeed Great Britain with uh, deaths per, per million of, of between 30 and perhaps 100 at the, 
uh, the most. And even if you don't trust, or even if you're a bit suspicious of those overall global figures, let's look at some more precise figures. The number of people who have died in, f- from this crisis in New York is about 22,000. In London, it's 6,000. In Seoul, which is a big bustling city in the capital of, of South Korea, actually bigger than New York or, or London in terms of population, it's about 100 probably less than 100. So there are just really huge differences. And they tell us something very worrying about the state capacity of Western countries versus uh, countries in the Far East. But isn't it a fact that, or, or a factor, that countries in the Far East are more accepting of or afraid of not turning over their data? I mean, the contact tracing and the ability to quarantine in uh, South Korea, China, Taiwan has been much more effective than here, and I don't think we'd accept it. Well, several things. I think one, yes, you know, there's a little bit there, but I think, again, you know, go go back to your example, go back to Adrian's example, Seoul. Now, obviously, I know you and Dennis go there often, but Seoul Seoul is the home of the world's biggest nightclubs. Um, It's the home of K-pop. It's the place which made Parasite, which won the Oscar last year. That you, you can't pretend that this isn't a modern, you know, slightly, often crazily democratic city. It's mad as mm. it sadly went. It, it's, it's, this, is, this has got all the signs of a kind of living, healthy democracy. Yes, people are slightly more inclined to do kind of test and trace, but, that, but you look across the web, there was no lack of enthusiasm for people to say, look, I'll stay at home in order to, 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 ward, off this, to ward off this disease. People were prepared to do that. The underlying reason is not to do with consensus or things like that. It's just simply they're more efficient. They, they, they Test and tracing, if you don't have the system to do it, which America didn't, then it's no good. And the same with Britain as well. So these are the, it's, it's like all these things. You can look for th- reasons to do with authoritarianism or whatever. It's not that you, you, if you go to Asia, Seoul is, is, is very, you know, if you wandered across streets of it, you would think it was no different to New York. And yet you look at the numbers it's dramatically different. Well, I think it's interesting uh, that you make the case in the book that it's not just authoritarian versus, let's say, free market governments. I mean, you've got examples of both and and they don't necessarily match up. And so that's interesting. But I want to ask you, uh, Adrian, uh, one of the things that comes across is what is the proper role of government? And, And then not just the proper role, but how effectively or efficiently is it done? So talk to us about that and, and what you found in your research and how it impacts this situation. Well, we, th- we think that the, the most important thing that government must do is to protect its citizens from unnecessary death or unnecessary harm. Uh, that's the argument that was advanced in 1651 by Thomas Hobbes in his great book, Leviathan, and I think it's the argument that still underlines all thinking about the state. Um, it's that you have to protect people from attack from outside. So your, your primary commitment is to have a defense uh, military capacity that works, yeah. but you also have to protect them from unnecessary death in terms of you know um, pathogens being spread in the air or, or citizens who are vi- violent and, uh, and, and attack each other. It's a defensive thing against death. Now there are other things that we we have to we have to be concerned about. We have to be concerned about liberty. We have to be concerned about uh, freedom of information. Um, we have to be concerned about accountability. But ultimately, the Hobbesian thing is what you start off with. That's what government must do. And it's this Hobbesian function of protecting people from unnecessary death that I worry that that that, that American to some extent Britain. Uh, has has failed in doing, and that you know China and some of these South Asian, uh, these East Asian countries are succeeding in doing. And it's not because I don't care about liberty, but I think if you're if you're such so committed to liberty that you're actually sacrificing people's lives in order to maintain liberty on a large scale, then liberty itself will be tarnished. Let me uh, let me push something there. Uh, you, you look at that Pew Research survey about trust in government. And Mm -hmm. we sort of peaked in the last 60, 70 years at 77% back in the late 50s and 60s, and then down to 20% now. Um, A guy I know, an economist named Robert Higgs wrote a book called Crisis and Leviathan, which he Uh basically said, 
that government has grown so much and it grows because of crises and this is one of them as well but the wars in particular if you look at that chart what you see is is that the confidence in government in the u.s has gone down significantly after wars vietnam lbj as an example george bush uh, iraq as an example and we've had these things and, and government has grown so it's not sometimes you guys talk about the size of government i guess my concern is limited government uh, versus uh, small government. Uh, John, can you address yourself to that? Yeah, to be really clear. I mean, what, what's happening in Asia is that they're making smaller government. That's the point. Um, you're absolutely right, is that you look since, if you think the answer to the problems in America is more government, well, then that's what you've been getting for a very long time. If it hasn't, I mean, it's, it's a really a question of which way you look at it. Republicans claim they're into small government um, and they relentlessly veto things, but they don't. They keep on adding regulations, um, and they tax breaks. You look at the tax system, you've got $1.6 trillion worth of exemptions stuffed in there, making government ever more complicated. No, what's interesting is that Asia did exactly the same with government as they did with cars. You remember the 70s, um, the Japanese came up with smaller, more efficient cars. What happened was Detroit, copied that you know certainly toyota honda all these ones made huge inroads but america fought back on government what's happened is in singapore you have a model of smaller government every republican should think about this you know singapore is a place which delivers public health care delivers better education by any measure massively better than america and it's done that for about 20 30 years and yet it has a smaller state than america and a lot of it, just to be really clear, is, is a Republican's fault. If you look at the Singaporeans, they pay the people who run their civil service a million dollars a year. They get rid of bad teachers. Democrats would hate that, but that's what they do immediately. So this, the question is really about applying the same logic that has worked so well in the American private sector towards the public sector. So we're, we are not, there are certain areas where we think America should do more for people. We think healthcare is one of them. But in general, no, we, we are fierce believers in trying to keep the state as small as possible because for all exactly the reasons you said. But, but I think that's the great cop out is that whenever people start asking Americans to look at their government and ask, just look at how badly it's done. You know, it's not just COVID. If you were doing well at education, we might say, well, that's good. You know, you're lousy at that. You're lousy at life expectancy. Virtually every measure, these people are doing better. And yet there is a refusal to copy it. And when I say that, it's not just America, it just stands out more because it's America. It's true of other places. What you're basically saying is we need a smarter government. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, what, what you've got um, is a government that's bloated, that governments that's been sprawling, that's been sprawling into all sorts of areas, sometimes which aren't really its business, and that's been overpromising, and government's been promising more and more. And you can actually draw a graph which shows trust in government has been going down at exactly the time when government has been expanding into, in, in, into, into new areas and, and, and growing. So I think what we're arguing for is cutting government in some ways um, in order to restore trust and cutting the expectations of government in order to, to, to restore trust. Um, you know, we, we would say smarter governments, that might mean smaller governments, it might mean bigger government. I think overall it would mean slightly smaller government, but it would above all mean much more disciplined government. I think one of the things you've said before is that government really just subsidizes by writing checks. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it, I mean, I, I, the heroes in our book, just to be really clear, are people like Gladstone, William Gladstone in, in, in Britain and Abraham Lincoln in America. Uh, these were liberals, Terrible word for some people in Texas, but these were these were liberals of the sort we are, which is Adam Smith, is John Stuart Mill. That, that's what liberalism really is. And their point was, if you can have government, direct it towards the poor. Don't have a tax code with $1.6 trillion worth of, of, of exemptions and exceptions, but actually all of which go to the rich. And I think that's part of the aim of this, is to redirect government to where it's really needed. So we make, for instance, um, the, the annoy some people, we make the social, quote unquote socialist argument that America should have a sort of universal healthcare system, one modeled on Germany or Singapore or in these places. One of the reasons why we do that, to be really straightforward, is we think it would be cheaper. Um, in the moment, one of America's dirty secrets is you spend more money in public healthcare, excluding all the private healthcare, than supposedly socialist Sweden. 
And the reason is because you've got this endlessly complicated system that politicians have put forward where they've claimed exemptions, all the subsidies for private health insurance, all these different things. You are spending taxpayers' money on this. And it would you've seen with COVID that the problems of not having a system that caters for everybody. So on some issues, yes, we take we take stances that are um, might appear to the left, but when it comes to having small government, we are far stronger on that than any Republican because they, they at the moment that you, you have these people in Washington who claim to be small government people and yet don't even begin to work out what that means. Their only answer is to have less government. If you want less government, you can go to Congo. It has very little government and it's not much fun. Or for that matter, you could go to New York during the COVID crisis. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think most of us are uh, perhaps liberals, um, that is classical liberals in the 18th century tradition, if we could <laughs> cause that. Uh, but the thing that that comes across is the situation that we're in now getting from point A to point B is an issue. So Adrian, I'd like you to address a couple of things. First, uh, the idea of culture and how much, if anything, culture plays in these things. And then secondly, Let's just say you talk about healthcare as an example. We have a system that has evolved over a long period of time in which there is basically uh, no transparency and pricing here, which is one of the issues that we think we have in healthcare here. So address those two things and how it relates to particularly being able to provide a response to a pandemic. Well, uh, culture, one argument about culture is that America is so committed to individualism and freedom that it will never be able to deal with a, a, a pandemic because it won't just won't ex accept the restrictions on individual freedom. And I just don't think that that's right. I think that Americans have a, a, a sense of responsibility. They have a culture that is very adaptable. You had um, during the first and Second World Wars in particular, in particular the Second World War, you had people who are willing to make enormous sacrifices of individual freedom. I mean, call people up to fight in, in, in a war a long way overseas. So I don't think there's anything inherent in American culture that stops them from being willing to do the right thing in a crisis. Um, I think it's a bit of a cop-out, actually. Nor do I think that in the Far East there's a culture of acceptance of authority from uh, fr from above, as John said, you know, in in, in a country, in a place like South uh, South Korea, you've got uh, a very not quite individualistic, but a very freewheeling culture. You know, vibrant night nightlife. I've seen demonstrations in, in in Seoul of a vigor that I've never seen anywhere else in the world. You know, it's a very very outspoken uh, uh, culture. I think it was a failure of governments more than anything else, and a sort of a set of assumptions about government just being a bad thing. And I don't think that's something inherent in the American character. I think that's something that's come in um, since the, the, the 1980s from a, a misinterpretation of what Ronald Reagan was saying or an extrapolation of what Ronald Reagan was saying. Ronald Reagan was saying, don't get government to do things that, 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 that the private sector can do better. But that's been interpreted as saying, you know, just shrink government, get government out of the way. I, I think that you need to have a bit of a return to the tradition of the 1960s, whereby all part, both parties agreed that serving your country is the highest calling and serving your country, you know, can be done through, through, through government. It's not just done through, through participation in, 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 in the military. Um, when it comes to the convolution of the American healthcare system, and I lived in America for 13 years, so I've filled out my own share of forms, but I think that there comes a point where things become so convoluted and so counterproductive, uh, so time consuming and so inefficient that you just have to really take, take an ax to them and, and, and go back. And it, it, it is a terribly inefficient system, but it's also a very, very, very expensive system. Now, you can have a national insurance system, such as Germany or Singapore, where everybody has compulsory insurance. Or you could have one that's a completely private system where everybody has to buy their, their own system, they're compelled to buy their own system. But, but having a system like the one you have, which is a bit corporate and a bit individualistic and a bit public, just multiplies complexity in a way that's very, very dangerous. 
So the Pew Research Center came out recently with a, a new survey, and I think it was in about 13 or 14 countries, and it showed that 84% of respondents said that the United States has basically blown it. We failed on our handling of, 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 of COVID. I wonder, John, what you think about that the impact of this will be on the United States' ability to, to lead and its perception around the world. Well, it's here that we start to get more optimistic. It's, you know, it's worth pointing, we called our book The Wake Up Call because we still think that, the, one, firstly, we think that America is more than capable of waking up. It's done so before in different phases of history. But, and, and particularly, it tends to do so whenever there's an adversary. In this particular case, you now have China as something that, 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 that America wants to challenge. I think there's, there's two points to this. Firstly, yes, it's unquestionable. You know, America has done worse than other places. But you, you look at, again, you were saying this earlier, you look at, auto it's not an argument for autocracy. You look around the world, there's only one autocracy that's really done okay, which is China. Most of the other ones are done lousily. You wouldn't want to have got COVID in Iran or any of the Stans or Russia or North Korea. Most of the countries have done really well are democracies. You know, New Zealand, Australia, we haven't mentioned we haven't mentioned some of the European ones, which have done pretty well. So there's no kind of link in that direction. And secondly, if you look at the democracies around the world against the autocracies, by any measure, um, they're stronger. And actually, one of the things where Biden, there may be people on this call who, who were, were pro Donald Trump, but and Donald Trump may have got one thing, big thing right in terms of sort of spotting China as a, as a, as a, as a competitor. But the one thing he unquestionably got wrong is you, you, you look back at the Cold War, America won, won that in part because it had allies and it had a message of freedom. If America's message is just America first, you put off allies and it gives people the impression that all you're interested in is self-interest rather than freedom. Biden, strengths and weaknesses, he has the possibility of uniting the democracies. If he does that, it's no competition. So, so there's, there's absolutely no reason at all why if you, if you if you take america against china i would argue america is still stronger if you take china versus europe you might argue that china is stronger than europe the one thing which is unquestionable is that europe plus america yep. are much yep. much stronger than china and if yeah, you start at the democracies of asia which are there to be taken then it gets very much stronger that way so for all those reasons america has a lot of latent strength but you cannot lecture the world when your government is as bad as it is at the moment. Thank you for that. Uh, Adrian, <laughs> Adrian uh, just, it, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, yeah. what, what are the solutions for, not just for America, but the whole West, the UK, uh, the EU and all that? Uh, what, what are the solutions we should be looking at here? I, I think we should be focusing government on its core functions. What's happened is that we've got a whole accretion of things that aren't central to what government uh, is done. We've government has sprawled and expanded beyond its core functions. So focus on your core functions. In in Europe, I think there's too much willingness to, to to have a sprawling welfare state. In America, there's too much willingness to direct the benefits of government to the rich rather than to the poor. Focus on your core functions, but understand that those core there are certain core functions that can only be done by government. A second thing I think is to is to give government some honour. Uh, one of the terrible things that's happened in the United States is that people have denigrated government. They said it's only the sort of thing that losers will go into. The best and brightest won't go into the public service. I think that's a terrible idea. The best and brightest, as they did in the 1960s, should be willing to go into the public service. I'm particularly concerned about the way, you know, we're in the middle of a technological revolution uh, at the moment, uh, an IT-driven technological revolution, but the government is not becoming part of it because it's just not able to recruit um, the best people in technology because private companies offer such so much bigger rewards and because frankly you know young people won't work for a badly organized cumbersome over bureaucratic government sector so we you need to both redesign the reward system and the and the work system to recruit uh, younger people so you need you need a lot more talent and a lot more leadership going into in, in into the public sector because Government can't do everything. Government should be asked to do everything. But there are certain core things which we've seen particularly um, highlighted during the pandemic that only government can do. Um, and uh, America has failed at those. 
too often in the United States, if it's not developed here, it may not be a good idea. And it may be surprise yeah. some people that China really does look at other countries to develop its best yes. practices. That's very I mean, much right. I, mean, what, 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 I mean, that's really a serious problem, isn't it? That China might become a very, be more like Singapore. Yes. I think that I think that is it. I think that is. I mean, there's a debate going in China, and there's a lot of bad things about China. We saw that, you know, even now they're keeping the WHO people out of seeing what 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 happens in the beginning of um, um, of the virus, and so when we we would not herald China on everything, but what is true is that they are learning, and and that, there is a history in this. If you if you feel as if you were left behind because your government was no good, then you're more willing to look at things. And I think America just waking up to the fact that it now has fallen actually further behind. I mean, that you cannot get clearer than the cap between 1,300 lives lost for every million people and countries which lost a 30th of that, a 40th of that, even if you, as Adrian said, even if you apply skepticism to the Chinese figures. Um, so, so I think there is an incentive. It, it, it's not that difficult to look and learn. It's what American companies do every day of the week. In, in American companies, in private sector, if there was another co company that was 10% better than you, somewhere on the other side of the world, people would seek to copy it. Now you have another system that is 50 times better. You would imagine that somebody somewhere would bother to look above the parapet and see what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's exactly. the part of, of our book. Yeah, John, I think, uh, John, you and Adrian, uh, first of all, thank you for writing the book. Thank you again for joining Jim and me on this program because your insights are extremely valuable and we're going to try to learn from them. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we've heard, this is a very important issue and we need to learn from others and it's not too late to start. Dennis and I are very grateful to all of you for allowing us to bring perspectives that matter to people who care. I want to remind you that you can always catch up on our past programs by going to mcquistontv.com and please share our programs on your social media and we'll see you on our next program. Thanks again. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email nickyn at nickymcquistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash TV or download McQuistion TV video podcast on iTunes.